You once again find yourself in the safe harbor of the designer mode with me, Bungalow Bill. The Steel Striders and Deepwater Guard are waiting patiently in Neater to receive their savage beating, and Captain Sal will soon find the flotsam of his fleet scattered across the entirety of Neater. But we have more pressing matters at hand. I've recently become enamored with dirigibles, and I've decided that I must have one more in my collection. I've decided to tackle as much of this campaign as I can with displacement craft. Today, we'll be replacing my venerable interceptor the Locust with a blimp, you might ask. Won't a lighter-than-air vehicle make a terrible air superiority fighter? However, you may refrain from doing so, because I would decline to answer. This will be my first building stream, and as I am a slow builder, I will not be presenting the process uncut, but I will attempt to show the bones of my building strategies. I do not think that there is a correct way of building craft and from the depths. These are merely the habits that I've fallen into over time. Let us begin. Since this is my first build video, and my first build video of a displacement craft, and my first build video of a dirigible, we should start with first principles. Here we have a ship, and we'll go over what makes this ship float stably. Now, if I build it, we can see the center of mass and the center of buoyancy. The center of buoyancy is jiggling around relatively quickly, and that's because this ship is fairly wide. As an example, if I, can, if I was to consider a buoyant element of the ship some airspace or something else to give it buoyancy, and it's way out, it's way out here, as the ship heals to starboard, this element would become submerged and move the center of buoyancy to starboard. Conversely, if it was to heal the port, this element would lift up, decreasing the buoyancy on the side. Now, if I was to take the ship and build it with a high superstructure, or turrets fairly high up, and we were to heal the port, these heavy elements up here would move the port, shifting the center of mass. Now, we can imagine if this ship is in some state, and we heal it just a tiny bit more to port. So heavy objects in the superstructure, you know, if we had one, and heal the starboard. Elements in the superstructure, if we had one, would also shift to starboard. Our buoyancy hopefully shifts some amount to starboard. If our buoyancy shifts further starboard of our center of mass, we'll have a net torque trying to right our boat. If it fails to do so, our boat will have a net torque in the opposite direction, continuing to heal it further, and it will, it'll ultimately capsize. Now, in real life, there are additional things to consider because you have flow moving over the hull of your boat, and certain hull designs may be more or less stable based on hydrodynamic forces. From the depths lacks that, so the only thing that you're actually considering is changes in buoyancy with your heel angle and changes in center of mass with your heel angle. Now there is one additional consideration. If my boat is sitting too low in the water, what we'd consider being swamped, well now if it heals to starboard, you don't get any additional buoyancy because all of your buoyant structure is already submerged. And similarly, if I heal the port, I don't actually lose any buoyancy. This means that everything that I have that is keeping my ship stable, at least in terms of buoyant forces, will no longer function, and my ship will almost certainly capsize. The only thing that can stop it from capsizing are roll propellers, which this ship lacks, or simply a center of mass that's under the center of buoyancy, in which case your ship would behave like a pendulum. And for the most part, ships do not have that. You can build incredibly dense keels to get stability in that way by lowering the center of mass. But ships tend to have a sufficient amount of their, their mass above the waterline that their center of mass will be above the center of buoyancy. Even for a very flat ship like this, which was designed to have some ability to avoid shells just by being so thin, the center of mass is above the center of buoyancy. Now, 
if I was to instead have a simple blimp, and this one does not have roll thrusters or that sort of thing, so it's entirely reliant just on buoyancy. It does currently use a little bit of pumping of of air to maintain orientation, but you can see as it's healing quite badly, it's not it's not entirely enough to keep it stable. This is entirely reliant on the center of mass being beneath the center of buoyancy because a blimp is always fully submerged in the fluid that's attempting to be stabilized in, similar to a submarine. So the only thing it can rely on are roll thrusters and propellers and a center of mass under the center of buoyancy. Now, as heavy as this turret is, it is actually not always enough to keep this to keep this upright. And this is my only my only blimp that has turtled in combat. When a when a pressure tank was ruptured and it decided it was more stable to be in the other orientation, so it flipped over. My other other air vehicles that have been featured on stream, for instance or in videos, for instance. Are reliant on thrusters for stability. These would not stay upright otherwise. They they float based on based on their buoyancy. But these thrusters are not actually not actually really necessary to keep them at an even height. But they would not be so stable without them. So let's move on to our build. Now, when I'm building, I usually start by designing my weapon systems first. I know a lot of people like to build the, the hull first, and I don't really think there's a right or wrong way of doing this. But I want this weapon to, or this, I want this ship to fulfill a certain role. Is that I have a certain amount of ordnance that I require it to carry. So the first thing that I'm going to do is figure out exactly how much space that ordnance is going to occupy and what support systems it's going to require. After that, I can start thinking about how the hull is going to need to be laid down. Now, I intend for this to be a a laser interceptor to replace the locust. I think the laser power is going to be low enough that I'm going to wind up using a 4Q system. Which means I'm just going to start by making a making a prefab and just seeing how much that costs. I'm looking for the total cost of this vehicle to come in at around 30,000. Since this is going to be a blimp and it's going to be relatively high on the armor costs, I'm going to figure that the weapon system is going to cost approximately half of the cost of the vehicle. So that means that I need a little bit more than two times the cost that I currently have here. Now the other question is sort of the ratio of power use to storage that I have. Which, for a continuous laser system, I would usually go a little bit higher on, on the pumping energy. So I'm just going to replace one storage cavity. I'm not really a laser expert, so this is more of a, more of a feel than anything. Have 22,000 capacity. That seems fine to me. Okay, so the next thing is... I'm going to need about 6,500 engine power. So I'm going to go and make the engine independently and then slap it on here and see roughly how much volume these consume and then see where I can go from there.
Now, building, building out an engine, at least in terms of getting it, getting it functional, is relatively easy. You may or may not have seen people's engine test platforms before. They're relatively straightforward to put together. The main idea is that since I'm making a steam engine, to figure out exactly exactly how the steam engine is going to perform under full load in the game, I need to put it under full load here. So I'm just going to slap in some shield projectories. ECMs can consume 20,000 engine power, so they're also a very good way to do this, but shield projectors also work. And the next thing is to just build a steam engine. Now, there are, there are multiple ways to build steam engines, and I'm really not an expert in doing so. And in truth, it doesn't have to be highly optimized. Steam engines that are 80 to 90% of the way there are really good enough for my purpose. Now, I'm going to make a crank that's way too long. I'm going to trim it down later. And there are a few different geometries for steam, engine, for steam engines that you can work with. A popular one for the small steam engines is to have an M shape where you have, for each unit of crank, you have three pistons intersecting it. However, to make this volume efficient, people find that they generally need a seven by seven steam engine. That's too big for such a small craft. So we're going to go with a much, a much smaller steam engine. Now, I don't know exactly how the ratio is going to work out, so what we're going to try here, because I've only built one steam engine in quite a long time, is to just try is to just try working with a five five to three ratio on the first stage, and see how that works out. Now, one of the one of the problems with doing it this way is that the piping is going to be a little bit of a mess because to do it with that ratio, I essentially have to pipe all of these and this to these three. So that's not terribly efficient. We could try, we could try a three to two and see how well that works and see if it's close enough. The, the efficiency for piping it would be much better. Um, actually, now that I'm, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know how, how efficient that will actually work, but we can certainly, we can certainly try and see how well that balances balances the different pressures. Now, something to note now, this may have been different before, you actually need clearance above the exhaust for the piston. I don't know if this is always the case, but I thought that I was able to put things on top as long as they weren't connected and they would still exhaust properly. This certainly isn't the case now. I have to leave, leave those exhaust ports clear or this won't work. This is a very, very crude steam engine. The pipe layout is not terribly efficient. I don't have an input pipe, which I'm just going to toss here. And I'm just going to go ahead and toss some boilers on to see how it performs and how many boilers I need. That was actually cutting off a few too many, I think. That should be good. So 
So that's leaving 11 boilers left. Just 22 total. I can fit 15 in really easily. Well, actually, if I don't want the steam boiler unit to stick out, not quite 15. So I think I'm going to widen this assembly so that I have steam boilers here and steam boilers here. So definitely not good work, but it's efficient for a small vehicle. Now, what does concern me is that um, this may wind up being basically a bit large to slap into an interceptor. We'll see how that winds up winds up turning out. Of course, if I split this one, which I kind of have to, it's going to make this whole thing much more susceptible to leaks from taking damage than it would be otherwise. But we'll have to live with that, I guess. And with small vehicles, they tend to just kind of explode when they take damage anyway. With something this small, you don't throw away free space. All right, now I've got a steam engine that can power these lasers. which I'm just going to throw on just adjacent to the lasers. I'm sort of going to make a big brick on the interior of this vehicle that does all of the important things. And then everything surrounding this is going to serve as a lift for this vehicle. Now, since so far my internal components are in this very, very tight space. I'm going to make a tight a tight box for the AI that fits similarly. This won't be very small for an interceptor, but hopefully it'll work out fine. Now, this is not going to be a very efficient layout. That's just sort of just sort of how it has to be when working with such a small space. But I'm just going to have to live with that. Now, most of my air, most of my dirigibles so far I've made just point and stick at enemies with a frontal hovercraft. We're going to go with circling hovercraft for this one. Now, I want this to actively prioritize small vehicles. 
which means that this kind of stuff gets gets heavily deprioritized. This is going to be going to be quite crude, but I'll just go with this for now. And then once I get into situations where this doesn't work, I'll look at its rankings and see how I can fix it. But for now, that'll be how it is. Hopefully this won't need a huge amount of detection. Although a total processing power of seven may may still be whoops, may still be pushing it a little bit. If I have to add more, I'll I'll add more. I can I can expand this one back. Although it'd be way easier to do it now than it would be to do it later. Well, that should be perfectly fine. It's not a huge amount, but it's way better than way better than seven. All right, that should be fine. I don't know if anything will fall off when I take the spine apart, but we'll see. Excellent, everything's glued together. We're currently at 20,000. That leaves us with 10,000 for armor and propulsion. Now, the next question is what the overall shape of this should be. Because although I am just using this brick as a spine. It leaves me with a few with a few different options. I can sort of add buoyancy above and below and make it a very round blimp-like structure. And like a traditional blimp, I can then put a little cockpit underneath to continue to make this very wide and to have just a layer of armor on top and on the bottom, and then to have buoyancy compartments on the side, like I've done with my other blimps. If I do that, I kind of want to make it visually a little bit distinct from them somehow. I'm not sure exactly how yet. Maybe by making the front, making the central compartment longer than the side compartments, unlike the other blimps that have a longer longer side compartments and a shorter a shorter central compartment and then either do twin cockpits or a little cockpit protrusion or maybe just my normal cockpit right on the front where rambot tends to get blown up very very early the next question is overall height because if I was to just slap one armor, one layer of armor right on the top, one layer of armor right on the bottom, we're already up to a five meter thick craft, which is pretty big for an interceptor. And I don't really think that I want to go to seven. I do need a little bit more material storage and I'm gonna need a little bit of fuel storage because I'm going to be using custom jet engines for propulsion. It doesn't need a lot. So I don't think I'm going to fill up all of this room. I might wind up putting an air pump here and getting just a little bit of extra, extra buoyancy space out of it. But I'll put that there. And then... Toss down... 
Toss down maybe just a little bit of extra material storage. This is already more than half of the planned cost of the crafts and material storage, so I don't really think I need more than that. Now, I'm going to slap on what I think will be decent enough propulsion for it, and then I'm going to try to get a decent a decent idea of what I want this craft to look like. An additional option that I do have is to take this entire central block of the craft, rotate it 90 degrees, and then to either make the whole thing a cross shape, or a sor sort of a sunfish shape, or sailfish shape, but... I don't think I want that. I think that'll make it a little bit too vulnerable. We'll also see if I have a little bit of extra extra cost at the end left over, and I can do anything anything along the lines of active countermeasures, which I usually don't put on craft this cheap. This one will probably have a small lambs because it has lasers, but that'll probably be about the limit for it. I also need to consider... how I want to mount the turrets, the laser turrets. I don't think I want to do the Solaris thing where it just shoots when it points at the enemy. I probably have to give it more storage to do to do that. I'm probably going to mount, mount an above and below laser turret. And I'll have to see. I may make them just horizontally oriented and try to give them enough firing arc to hit reasonably above and below and maybe give the craft a little bit of roll to the enemy. We'll see. It won't be that maneuverable though. Anyway, let's drop some rockets to it. Now, I'll use small custom jet parts. This, this could fit This could fit larger with the normal size, because I can get a 3x3 three three here. But... I don't need a whole lot of power on this, so I think I'm just going to put just a few custom jet engines like this, so it doesn't drink too much fuel in combat. It's already going to be very... Oh, I need to put a... Well, for now, I'm just going to have them run full burn, but I'll put some put some ACBs on to regulate them at some point. This is already going to be pretty, pretty resource hungry from all of these compared to if it shot missiles or APS. It will not show me show me firepower until I stick. stick a laser combiner on it. Actually, that does point out point out something I'm going to want to leave space above and below this. 20 laser power. That's not terrible. So, I'm going to give it I'm going to mount the laser turrets directly above and below this. Partially to save on block camp, partially because I'm lazy. But that'll leave me room for that. Now, let's go back to strapping rockets to it. This would probably give it a similar thrust to weight as my previous vehicles. It is an interceptor, so I'm going to make it go a little bit faster. I can never tell which direction these are pointed. I have no idea if that's correct or not. I'm going to have to look at this one. Alright, that looks good. There's also no exact science to how you build custom jet engines. I don't need these to be immensely powerful, so I'm just going to give them one combustor, two compressors to make them a little bit, a little bit more efficient. But 
it's probably fairly fairly optional for how you build them. One compressor is probably fine. Now, I don't actually need the intake to go all the way, and it's cheaper if I don't, so I won't make it go all the way. The ducts are here somewhere. Since this does have to be light enough to be a blimp, I'm going to entirely rely on lightweight allies. Yeah, so these aren't going to be nearly as materials hungry as the steam power. Hmm, at least the way it used to be, the steam engines would show double their max power when they're completely unloaded. But no, it's not that way anymore. So we'll be we'll be good on engine power. All right. This looks mostly fine. I'm gonna armor up the center, and then I'm gonna worry about building things around it. Now. I may just go for one level of armor all around on a vehicle this cheap. Just trying to think how that's going to how that's going to look height wise. I may wind up having to make the air tanks thicker anyway, especially because I'm going to have to put some form of backup thrust in them to raise and lower this thing if its air tanks are ruptured because I want some redundancy in it. But at the same time, I want to keep the cost fairly minimal. So I'm going to go really minimalistic for now. Maybe I'll regret having it be so lightly armored later. But usually, these cheap interceptors don't actually take that much damage. Now, I haven't kept track of how many blocks long I'm looking at. So this is where a stack of 4 meter blocks gets me. I'm just going to be okay with that for now. I'll stack everything in a... in a rough shape. And then worry about the exact details later.
All right, so this is a very rough, just interior armored box for, for where everything expensive inside this vehicle lives. Now, the next question is exactly what do I want this to look like? And how am I going to lay out the buoyancy? Because originally I was thinking, well, I'll put shorter tanks on the side for air. That's not going to be sufficient to lift this by itself, I think. And I haven't left room on the back. For some decent air tanks. There's room on the front that I can, you know, build this vehicle out a bit further. I don't want to build taller tanks on the sides because I'm going to be putting a laser turret and I want it to be able to shoot with a reasonable arc. I can go ahead and put lower ones on though. So I can have something that looks more like that. The question to ask myself now is, how do I want them to taper? And how am I going to hide my lift thrusters? I don't just want to make them out of wood because I don't want them to rupture that easily, but there may not be a choice because with a vehicle this cheap, I can't afford to skin this entire thing. Something I haven't done before is have my side side compartment sort of taper taper this way. But I think you need something that's significantly larger to get away with that. Well, I've been fooling around for a little while. And we are currently stable with three helium pumps. So I'm going to clean this up a little bit, but I'm going to go with something not too dissimilar, too dissimilar from this. My current thought is to space out the pontoon-like objects a little bit extra and then build, try to build some interesting looking connection between the two of them, leave myself a little bit of room to do something with this box so that it doesn't just look like a big lightweight alloy box. And then to start working in some roll thrusters and some backup up thrusters because I am very near my cost limit and this is still made out of wood so I'm just gonna have to deal with these pontoons being made out of wood. That and I still need to add in my laser turrets, which will probably push it slightly over the cost limit, but hopefully not by that much. Here we are, we've done a little bit more work. I moved these pontoons a little bit further out, connected them to the main hull with something that will hopefully give them a little bit of, little bit of character and not be severed, severed that easily. The next phase is to add some maneuvering thrusters in over the hull and into the pontoons and see if we can keep the weight the weight down on the cost. After that, some little laser turrets and I'll see where we're at in terms of buoyancy and cost. But for now, we're still floating fairly level at a high altitude with no additional power, which which is pretty good. I believe we'll lose a fair amount of altitude when I start putting bulkheads into the pontoons. 
but we should still be okay. I'm only only aiming for neutral buoyancy at a lower altitude than this. And here we are again. We are maneuvering. Currently, I don't have any PIDs, so we're a little bit wobbly, but I'll either leave it like that or just add one or two. We only have three degrees of freedom at the movement anyway, at least as long as we're at full burn. I think 61 meters per second is going to be sufficient, sufficient for me at the moment. So for now, I think I'm going to clean up the hull shapes a little bit, add the turrets, add the cockpit, and then see how it looks to see what I want to do with the rest of this big flat space that we have available to us. So I've been working on putting just very, very rudimentary lambs. Since I'm trying to keep the cost down, I'm only having two lambs nodes and I'm putting them putting them on top of the turrets. Now, uh, something to note here is these laser transceivers only, only connect through the back. These laser combiners are still listed as being connected despite the fact that they shouldn't be. So I'm going to complete this and then load and unload the craft and see if they're still connected. If they're not, I'm just going to have to shift a few things over in the turret by one block to make everything line up. Yeah, so it looks like... Oh. Well, we're shooting ourselves. I set the failsafe. Well, I didn't think that would work. But the laser combiner is still listed as being connected. I didn't see a beam coming out of this one, but I'm pretty sure it was firing. I'm not sure what I'm going to have to do to get, get the failsafe working. I'm not sure if it's defective because I'm using one all-in-one local weapon controller, both for the failsafe on this and for the turret, and it's just not, not working properly. But the failsafe should work, even if I set this radius down to zero. But I set it all the way up to one meter and I'm still shooting myself. Once I finish the rest of the craft, I'm going to have to do a little bit of work to see why that's actually happening. At the moment, we are currently operable. We have small detection setups on both turrets. I'm fine with condensing them on the turrets because if we lose the turrets, we don't have any need for detection. So let's go test out that detection. So our detection chance right now is really bad. It looks like at the very least we need a few better trackers, like likely. One of the problems is that we don't have many places that I can actually put a lot of detection that will reliably be able to see the enemy. And we don't have the most processing power or the most freedom as far as cost because I've already run over by about 2,000. So I don't just want to paper the entire vehicle with, with trackers. I also don't care about 
about getting range correct at all. All that I really need is bearing, and I already have the coincidence range finders, and they should be able to do that very well if they have vision. I can't afford to have two more because they use so much general purpose. General purpose processing power. We're set up to broadside, and we have... One point five one point five left, so I can't set down two of these. I just like to find something that costs point five to throw on each broadside and call it a day. These are pro well, actually these might be really useful because we'll probably be shooting down a fair number of things that have hot blocks on them. Now, no matter where I put these, it's not going to be not going to be necessarily the best. Given my craft's propensity to shoot itself currently, putting them on a high or a low spot could be a potential hazard, but I'm still going to do it. That was interesting. I was holding down tab that whole time and I still moved. Even the IR camera is not picking them up that well. I might just have to accept that I have some trouble tracking such a small target. I would like to do better, but I have a very, very limited amount of processing to work with. And this isn't, this isn't awful right now. Well. I say that, but it's then spiking to 50, which is quite high. Looks like we're doing better than 50, though. Oh, I forgot another thing. Yeah, I really don't know why our detection is. Is quite so bad. Alright, I think this is going to have to do for the moment. We'll be able to shoot down small fighters and blimps, and that's sort of the... Not blimps, and nukes, and that's sort of the purpose of this craft. Particularly when we're fighting against the... The Steel Striders and the Grey Talons, I want to make sure that we don't get hit by their nukes. These need to not shoot, for me to not shoot myself though, I'm losing a lot of firepower because of that. The failsafe, I'm not sure, is working that well. I guess we're actively using our detectors fairly well. Our detection chance is just a bit low. I also don't have us set up to maintain a fraction of our of our laser reserves for lambs. Due to our relatively high pumping power, I felt like we probably don't have to. So I don't think I'm going to set that up. I 
as it is now, I think I'm just going to save this vehicle, drop it into the campaign, and then... Well, I'm going to figure out if I can make us stop shooting ourselves, then put it into the campaign. And then if I find some major problems with it, I'll... I'll fix them. See if I can do something to make myself a little bit happier with the styling. The thing is, I can't put anything in the way of the turrets. And I can't cut down this width at all because the AI is under here. So I have to leave this part armored. We'll be very vulnerable to Hesh, but there's not much I can do without just making this craft thicker. So I'm going to play with the fail saves for a while and see if I can get something going. So what's become apparent to me after a little bit of testing is that your local weapon controller can't control a turret and a weapon and still use the failsafe successfully. The failsafe will not apply to the turret and to the weapon. Now, this is unfortunate because given the way I placed everything, I can't actually make this this Tetris work in such a way that I have two local weapon controllers and have them both be protected unless I just make the turret bigger, which might actually be the way to go. Currently, I just have a very, very vulnerable local weapon controller kind of poking at the top, which, well, I might stick with for now anyway, even though it's obviously a really poor way of doing things. I really did want to have these really small turrets, but I only need to add one block of width to one side to be able to add a more protected weapon controller in. Still, for now, I spent enough time building this that I feel like I can just go ahead, jam it into the campaign, give it a little bit of actual battle testing, see what works, see what doesn't, and then once I have it all fixed up, I'll go for a little bit more aesthetics and a coat of paint somewhere. I never really use mimics or decorations, so I won't put that in, but this still has a fair bit of buoyancy to play with, so I can go and adjust, adjust some of these tanks and either pull them in in the middle a little bit to give them to give them some more character or similarly do something like that here. There's the potential that I can replace some of the stone I mean, some of the wood with stone for more dis durability or the lightweight alloy with metal for more durability. I would like to ensure that it still will float in water with both of these ballast, ballast tanks ruptured when it splashes down because it does not have up thrusters for durability. It only has the ability to correct pitch and roll. So if it loses if it loses too much buoyancy, it'll eventually splash down and I'll want it to keep floating so it can at least keep fighting even if it can't actually maintain altitude. Listening. I'm going to make sure that I've recaptured a proper proper top speed and I'm going to move on to the campaign with this, replace the, the locusts for now as I go and probably do an all displacement campaign for at least a little while. Bungalow bill of future past here. I have now brought this new vehicle that I have named the Thundershock into the campaign mode. You haven't seen it, but I will be editing and posting those videos at some point. Now, it did have a run-in with the Cat Shark, where the Thundershock was the primary vehicle tanking damage, which it was never really designed for, but it did reveal to me that it could really use some armor upgrades. So I've gone ahead and put heavier armor on the flotation tanks. I've also added an additional lamps node. It could probably use one or two more, but I am trying to keep the cost down. Unfortunately, this flashing from the laser is just something that I have to live with for now at the beta branch. Hopefully the patch will be posted soon, but I have not seen a way to revert the latest update myself currently. Now, these upgrades have come at a bit of a cost. We are now at almost 30,000 materials out of the 30,000 that I desired. But 
this cost is still reasonably close enough, and I think it's more cost effective now than when it was at 32,000. So I'm going to keep it this way, give or take. I did put it against the Iron Maiden and found that the Iron Maiden could puncture this one layer of light alloy with one barrage when hitting it from below. So I may bring this from one layer to maybe one and a half layers using slopes or poles as the additional layer. If I go through the trouble of doing that, I'll probably also replace these turrets with something a little bit more durable that don't just have expensive squishy components sticking out the side and have the ability to elevate as well. Although something I did do was because I could never get the failsafe truly working, there was always some small amount of air to it that was causing it to clip some blocks. I put firing constraints on the turrets and those do have the benefit of making it so that the turrets will pick the targets that they can shoot at. So if there's a swarm of steel striders craft or that sort of thing, the bottom turret will fire at vehicles below the craft and the top turret will fire at vehicles above the craft at the same time. Well, I believe this is truly the end of the episode now. I hope you have all enjoyed watching and I hope to see you again soon.